Well, hello again everybody, and today we're going to be having a look at this Apple Macintosh Plus computer. Well, I'm afraid I really can't tell you very much about this thing, but of course there's a little bit of a story that comes with it. So this computer came from my friend and yours, Richard at work. You all know Richard by now, he brings me all these wonderful things which uh, need repairing, and it's kind of quite good because once I've repaired them I actually get to give them back again and free up some space. And this time he's, uh, he's brought me this Apple Mac computer and uh, the story goes, let me turn it round so you can see it a little bit more. So apparently the story goes that back in the 80s he used to read uh, these home computer magazines and stuff like that and uh, they used to feature this, uh, this Apple Mac Plus computer. But of course back in the day these were very very expensive and uh, of course most people and uh, certainly Richard we couldn't afford to buy them so you know he wasn't able to buy one back in the 80s so many years later he actually came across this for not very much money in a charity shop I think he said he paid maybe 10 or 20 pounds with it and unfortunately it was incomplete so we've just got this base unit here he's also missing the keyboard and the mouse but he thought he would buy it and have a go now the first thing I think he realised when he plugged it in is that it needed a, a disc, maybe it has a disc operating system. So apparently what he did is he put a disc in and I think it maybe started to boot the disc up or something. But when he pressed a button to eject the disc, he says there was just like a little bit of a crack and uh, well, all the power went off in his house. Well, I'm, uh, I'm familiar with that feeling. Uh, I have a habit of tripping the mains out quite regularly. What he's said is, he says, can I actually uh, pull this apart? Can I actually see maybe what's failed in it? And, uh, you know, if possible, can I repair it? Because he, he wants to kind of get it working because the actual mice and keyboards for these are apparently they're very expensive to try and get these days so before he spends any more money trying to purchase a mouse and keyboard he wanted to know if I could uh, get it functioning again and I've got, I said to be honest Richard, I've got absolutely uh, I've got no idea whether I'll be able to repair it or not but uh, I will gladly have a look at it for you so that's what we're going to do today um, I know nothing about computers, absolutely nothing I used to work with PCs and stuff back in the day um, I haven't got any circuit diagrams for this, I'm assuming that it might be possible to uh, download them from somewhere. But, you know, as per usual, let's just crack on regardless and see if we can figure out what's gone wrong. Well, I've actually got no idea what screws we need to take out or in fact leave in, so I'm just going to take every screw out I can see. Oh, and I think I might have uh, reached my first failure point. Now, unfortunately, these uh, screws are recessed a long way down here. Ah, oh, so that's my first fail. Can't actually reach the screws. Well, I've got a long slotted head screwdriver. I think that might have got one of them, but sod's law, the other one will be too tight to get out. Has that undone it? I think it might have done. Let's try it. Can we get the other one? What do we do to open it up? No, I think I've got the screws out. I think I can feel the front moving. Do I just pull? the back just lift off maybe. Let's try that. Well I've just spotted something really interesting inside this case. It looks like the plastic moulding, the uh, whatever they use the tooling to make this, it looks as though it's all been hand signed. There's lots of signatures inside it. Wow that's amazing. I wonder if these names here are all the um, original designers who worked on this computer. Um, Got no idea, there's certainly an awful lot of names there. That's really an interesting feature, a bit special that, isn't it? So just taking a look inside, I'm afraid I can't really claim to know anything about these computers at all, but this looks as though it's the uh, the main power supply board. There's what I would call the computer board through there. There's a motherboard, but this, this side looks as though it's got the, uh, the power supply on it and uh, the drive for the, uh, the CRT. So this is some form of power board. Uh, looking at it, we've got the mains input connector here. We've got some of those Y-rated capacitors which go between uh, line, neutral and the uh, ground connection. Then we've got a common mode choke. We've got an X-rated capacitor there, so I'm guessing that that one is across the mains. I'm wondering if this is a rectifier bank here for the switch mode. Not exactly sure. Got some smoothing capacitors and some more chokes. Maybe we've got a switching transistor down here. I'm actually thinking that maybe we just do some resistance test on the input to the, the mains input to see 
if we can measure anything which is a short circuit because the fault with this is it tripped out the earth leakage circuit breaker in uh, in Richard's house so we need to have a look at that I suppose we could test some of these uh, big capacitors under here we could actually check them for ESR it could be that we've got a capacitor that's gone short circuit but the failure mode was that what he did was he put a disc in it um, and then he I think he tried to eject the disc and it was working up until the point he pressed the uh, disc eject and as soon as he pressed that button uh, I think he didn't say there was a bang but maybe the uh, the motor engaged which was to throw the disc it out and he said when that happened uh, all the power went off it tripped out so I guess we probably want to make sure it's switched on so that was off that was on sorry that's off that's switched on now one of the failure modes of these is you can actually get them so that these capacitors fail and they will actually uh, take your consumer unit out they'll take the earth leakage circuit breaker out but sometimes when you come to test them again they're fine because uh, they do call these capacitors self-healing and uh, to be honest when the insulation fails and punches through sometimes the fault does immediately clear so they appear to be good again but they, they usually do keep failing so I wonder if that's a problem so you can see that the uh, resistance reading it's flicking around it's uh, it's increasing isn't it it is slowly going up so we're actually measuring the uh, probably these capacitors here which are across the mains to uh, to neutral sorry to earth so I'm going between probably the live connection now and the earth and what I could see happening there is uh, one of these capacitors was charging up and when it fully charged the meter stopped increasing so let's check the other one all right so it looks as though these two capacitors here we could see them charging up and then the uh, the meter went to infinity so we've got we haven't got a short to earth at the moment but between live and neutral we have got 456 kilo ohm. well simply because I don't know any better at this stage I think I might try to disconnect the disk drive because I think that's one of the things which Richard thinks caused the problem well I think while I'm here I might as well test what's visible so I can just see some diodes so I've just got onto the uh, the diode check range so let's uh, let's try them we might as well have a go at checking them there's a diode there's a diode there's a diode so I can see inside we've also got various capacitors probably associated with the switch mode power supplies but none of them are right, obviously bulgy in fact there's actually quite a lot of dirt and crud. I was actually expecting that if this had seen a lot of use that it would be really filthy inside and actually everything is remarkably clean. So I'm actually wondering exactly how much this compute how much use this computer actually ever had. Okay, so we've got a little bit of glow on the lamp, but that's probably normal for the amount of power this is is uh, is actually pulling. So that powered up. Now Richard's concern was that it was actually a problem with this uh, disk drive and of course I have unplugged that disk drive so I think all we can actually do is uh, plug the disk drive back in okay so that appeared to fire up should we see if it goes bang when we put it on full power so that is appearing to work now isn't it so I'm kind of just left wondering now how do we actually get the uh, the disk drive out there's some screws on the outside but I don't know if I can really get at them ok have got a shield here can I just take that shield off easily well I've just done the usual thing and I've had a bit of a google around and it looks as though in theory I can just slide this motherboard out and if I slide the motherboard out I should be able to get access to the screws I did try pulling at the board earlier and it didn't seem to want to move but I think you just got to put a bit of force behind it oh that's tight okay so that's the uh, that's the logic board out let's uh, follow all relevant anti-static precautions by just bunging at the back of my desk there here we can get access to this drive bay now right so that's the uh, that's the disk drive out 
and uh, Richard wants to get the disc out of it so the question is what do we do to make it spit the disc out Then you press that button. So just looking at the disk drive, it looks like it's a Sony disk drive, but I'm afraid again I'm at the edge of my knowledge here. Uh, I was just able to press this lever on the side of it, which uh, just made the disk eject on its own. But should this automatically eject? So the question is, why didn't Richard just press this button to get the disk out? Oh, right, okay, well I've just spotted a little hole here. And it looks as though that little hole lines up with uh, this shaft which I manually activated. So I'm guessing that perhaps uh, Richard, and in fact I didn't know either, so I'm guessing, I know I've seen the way the mechanism works, it's kind of obvious you probably put a paper clip or something in this little hole. Let me bring you in. Hopefully you can see there's a little tiny hole there, and I can see that that actually presses on the disc release mechanism. So when you actually press something in there, it probably throws the disc out. Now I've got to admit, just looking at this mechanism, I'm not really sure how this is designed to operate. I can actually press this metal tab here and it does make the, uh, the disc automatically eject. But I don't know, how would you actually do it when it was installed in the uh, computer? Because the problem is, this uh, little flap here, it's not actually accessible when it's installed inside the computer. I mean, you can push a, a paper clip in it, as I said, and that would have the effect of uh, pushing it back like that. But when it's actually normally running, is it controlled? Does it have a solenoid release mechanism? Is that how you eject these things? Looks like I might have to uh, Google Apple Macs again to find out how you normally eject the disc from it. I've got no idea, I'm afraid. So as you can see, I've gone ahead and I've removed the main motherboard and I've now got it balanced on both the combination of a, a Sam's manual and a tea towel. And I've got all the wire just hanging out over the bench. What could possibly go wrong, eh? Let's find out. Right, okay, so should this do something if we put a disc in it now? Which way up do we put a disc in? I don't know. I think I might have the drive the wrong way up. I think it might go in that way. Ooh, so that drew a lot of power then. So is that what tripped out Richard's mains? I think it could be, couldn't it? So at the top of this disk drive we've got a couple of motors. We've got this motor here which I've previously removed. I'm just guessing that this is used as part of the eject mechanism. And then we've got another motor here which looks as though it moves the, uh, the disk drive's heads backwards and forwards. I also tried disconnecting that one and it didn't seem to reduce the current. And the only other, uh, the only other motor we've got is uh, we've got this motor on the back which uh, I think it's a DC brushless motor isn't it and uh, this one actually spins up the disk drive itself well again this motor seems to be moving but for some reason when I actually put a disk in you could just see that it started drawing what I'm going to say is excessive current of course I don't know what current it should draw and it might be again I'm getting a false positive from this uh, lamp limiter but you're always not sure are you I mean my next step is really to kind of you know put a, put a fuse back in or turn the lamp limiter off and see if something goes bang but I think you know my gut feeling is that if I actually do that something probably will go bang the only other thing I'm wondering is if I had another of these uh, ribbon cables which I don't have I could perhaps uh, get at these lines here find a circuit diagram for this now of course what I'd like to do is just substitute this disk drive for another one but I, I don't think I have one that's got this uh, pin configuration it has actually got a Sony model number on it and maybe maybe it'll be worth googling to find a little bit more details about the power connectors on this so it says it's a Sony model number MP F51W-031 so that's model MP F 51W-03 so it might be worth googling that and uh, as I say I don't know if this is going to be some form of you know standard floppy drive or if uh, Apple would have chosen to have uh, spun their own because they were into that kind of homespun wankery weren't they to get the price down they didn't like uh, paying for patents and paying the full price for stuff so it may be one that they had a uh, you know they had homespun by Sony for them uh, just don't know, I'm really out of my depth with home computers and stuff like that. 
But I think what I was trying to say is I've tried disconnecting the uh, the actual head drive motor. That didn't reduce the current. I've tried re uh, removing the eject motor. That didn't reduce the current. And it looks like the motor that spins the drive up, that appears to work. So I can only think that that maybe if I had a, some kind of other ribbon cable, I could actually plug that into here and, uh, you know, probe the various DC lines. Because some of them are obviously going to be logic lines and some of them are going to be 12 volt power, 5 volt power. I think the old disk drives used to take something like 12 and 5 volts, didn't they? Actually, hard drives used to take quite a lot of current in the, uh, back in the day. So could it just be that, um, yeah, maybe it's normal, I don't know. I think I could do with probing these lines, checking some voltages. Let's see how much power this thing is actually drawing. So I'm just going to clip it onto there. And this thing is drawing 148, sorry, 100, yeah, oh, sorry, 184.85 milliamps. If I don't write these things down, I've got a memory like a sieve. So let's switch off. And I guess the tester will be, let's plug in the disk drive because that's when everything went pear-shaped according to Richard. So we've plugged the disk drive in, let's just switch on again. Okay, it's drawing just the same amount of current, it's drawing a hundred and... well it's actually drawing a little, but a little bit less, it's drawing a hundred and eighty-three rather than a hundred and eighty-five, so that's okay. But it really went, um, it actually went pear shape when, uh, when Richard put the disc in, so that's the real tester. So let's switch on again. Under eighty-three. let's snip the drive in. Come on. Oh, it did go up, the current briefly went up to 190 milliamps, but that seemed okay. Oh, and it's accessing the disk. So as you can see, it has actually booted up into the Apple operating system, so the computer appears to be working. Now I think what Richard's problem is, as I said earlier, he doesn't have a mouse or a keyboard for this, and you actually need a, a, a keyboard command to eject the disk. So having installed, put the disk in there, he couldn't get it out again. So it does look like this Apple Mac is actually working. The only thing I can really find with this drive is that it's actually quite dirty and contaminated and all the grease that would normally lubricate everything it's all actually very very um, dry in fact the grease has gone solid actually it's more like glue than grease now so all I can think that I can probably do for Richard is that I can uh, just do a little quick service on the drive and uh, just see if we can get the mechanism operate a little bit quicker a little bit freer and uh, that might improve things. So the way that you service this type of drive, well the first thing you've got to do is you've got to make it think there's a disc in. So you can see there's a little cam here, so you push that forward and the mechanism drops down like that. Uh, the second thing you can see is that you've got a couple of springs and we have to just disconnect those springs. Okay, that's one of the springs out. That's the other spring out, okay. Next thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to remove the uh, ejection mechanism. And there's a connector there which you just wrestle off. Get that out of the way. There's a little piece of plastic here. You've got to slightly lift up the head. Now this is a really dangerous bit. There's actually springs on these heads and if you start wanging this thing back really hard you will you will damage the springs on it and you'll break the uh, disk drive head so you've got to be very careful with that so what we're going to do is there's a there's a little plastic clip here which i've got to lift up with my finger which i've just done slide it back just got to lift the head slightly to get this clip off so i'm just going to lift that head slightly push the clip back it comes off in my hand like that and now it's just a matter of uh, wrestling this carriage out and it just comes out like that 
So this is absolutely thick with horrible congealed grease. So we're going to clean some of that off. Now just for the record it is actually possible to separate more parts of this drive. Uh, there's some like little rubber rings here. If you actually remove these four rubber rings you can actually lift this sliding platen off. You can lift it up and take it out the way. But the problem is these little plastic uh, locking tabs when you try to remove them they can, they can get brittle and they can fracture. And of course if you break one you won't be able to replace it. So um, I would say, well, basically leave it well alone, don't touch it. Uh, use your favourite degreaser on it, whichever uh, that may be. I'm using IPA, you could probably also use a bit of WD-40 sparingly, wouldn't make a lot of difference. Just basically look at all the places where the mechanism slides and rubs. Uh, there's lots of old congealed grease. I'm using, uh, do you call it a Q-tip? I think the Americans call them Q-tips. I think I call them a cotton bud. Just use a cotton bud to uh, wipe all that nasty old grease and stuff away. Actually, just actually giving that a clean and all the rubbish and you know built up gunk, it's actually moving much freer that even though we haven't even put any grease back on it. That's actually working a lot better than it was. And uh, that's part of the reason that maybe why uh, why it got stuck. I don't know if the uh, disk drive getting stuck could actually cause it to draw enough current to trip something out. I very much doubt it. I very much doubt that indeed. But uh, it probably didn't help. Right, we need a little bit of a uh, slippy slidey molly slip or something now. And I'm going to put a little bit of this, not too much, I'm going to put a little bit of stuff down there. A little bit round there. Right, got no doubt I've used uh, far more than I needed there. Let's have a look at this other part of this mechanism. Okay, so I've got another clean Q-tip. I'm going to very carefully lift up the drive head. Give it a wipe. You need to be very, very careful not to pull this up too far or you will damage the uh, springs on it. I'm making this far too hard for myself. It isn't that hard at all, really. Okay, that was it. Got it. You just have to work it in. Uh, I think I can put this piece of plastic back on now, which just slides on. That's it. That's got it. Oh, I nearly just forgot to plug the eject mechanism in then. That wouldn't have been good. Get in your little bugger. Right, a little bit more greasy greasy. Not bad, got a little bit too much grease on, just wipe that off because it does attract dust if you don't. And yes indeed it does appear to have accessed our floppy drive so that's a good sign. Well I've got to admit I'm not exactly sure that it is the Apple genius way to actually uh, balance the motherboard on a, an old Sam's magazine and uh, a tea towel with a chicken in it but it seems to have served as well doesn't it? This connector fills me with terror because it's really really stiff and the uh, the plastic is very brittle and it just worries me when you when you watch people undo these on youtube they just pull them off and they go oh yeah it just comes off i'm telling you these things are super super stiff it's basically the uh, there's like a retaining barb on them and uh, the plastic has just gone stiff so it's not flexible anymore so it just takes a lot more force than it should to actually uh, get the connectors off. You can see there's a, hopefully you can see there's this barb here that actually engages in this half of the plug and uh, well you, you just can't get it off, it just goes solid. Yeah, so I think that goes like that. Okay, so I think that goes that way around, doesn't it? 
if it's possible to get it the wrong way around you can guarantee that I will do that and then when we want to extract the disc because we don't have the keyboard you need something thin and pokey and we press that in and press it all the way in and the disc pops out so now hopefully we can reinstall the motherboard and the motherboard should just slide in well I'm going to make life easier for myself because I know that it was stiff getting it in so here's some WD-40 you can see everybody rolling their eyes oh, WD-40, you can't use WD-40, it's like poison let's put this big power connector back in and cable to the uh, floppy drive okay we need the uh, all essential EMC shield because uh, I'm sure that's just vitally important not Just seem to take a little while to think about reading the desk. Come on, anytime you're ready. There we go. Okay, and the fat lady sings. Well, I bet you didn't expect to see me again, or in fact this Apple Plus. But amazingly enough, I made a stupid mistake. I gave the computer back to my friend Richard and we were playing with it at work. And I think the computer, again, it had probably been on just over an hour when, again, it tripped out the main circuit breaker. So, damn, I know what that is probably. So, of course, I didn't do a proper job the last time. So, I've had to go back inside and I actually had to remove the... Uh, well, this is the big capacitor here. This one is the one that's actually installed across the mains. And then we've got two little capacitors here which are... Uh, they go between the line and the earth connection. Let me just show you those. So the big blue capacitor here, this is the X-rated one which is designed to go across the mains. And then you can see we've got the two Y-rated capacitors here which are designed to go between line and the earth. Now quite obviously I should have gone ahead and I should have replaced these capacitors first time round and uh, I didn't do it really because I was feeling quite lazy but I had had a look at all the other electrolytics now I didn't measure the electrolytics but I just give them a bit of a visual inspection for any bulging and this machine inside was just so clean I thought well it's probably had not a lot of use and I'd still say it hasn't had a lot of use but yeah uh, my mistake. Now while I had the uh, the power supply kind of exposed like this. I've actually also just gone ahead and I've checked the capacitance of all the electrolytics and also measured the ESR and I haven't found any problems with them they're all really low so again I would say this probably isn't a lot of hours on this but yeah it caught me out. Well I'm gonna go ahead now and I'm gonna put this back together and give it a test and hopefully this time that really will do so until next time bye bye for now.